stories don't define you, how you tell them will. Hi, I'm Sarah Elkins, your host and chief story maker at Elkins Consulting. In my work with coaching clients, I guide people to improve their communication using storytelling as the foundation of our work together. What I've realized over years of coaching and podcasting is that the majority of people don't realize the impact of the stories they share on their internal messages and on the people they're sharing them with. What really lights me up is guiding executives and uncovering the stories in their lives that are meaningful. The stories that, when shared with the right audience in the right way, connect, inspire, and motivate. Here's what a former client had to say about our work together. As a leader of leaders, I struggle with how and when to use my stories to emphasize the points my audience is looking for. It's a delicate balance between sounding like I'm bragging and delivering a message that needs to be heard. Sarah's approach to storytelling clears that obstacle so that you can deliver a clear and concise message using your stories to emphasize your points. It's truly amazing when it all comes together. Greg McDonough, Blackburn Capital Advisors, and president of the Entrepreneurs' Organization of Washington, D.C. Visit elkinsconsulting.com to learn more about working with me. I could not be more excited to introduce Dr. Christian Jarrett for the show, this episode, Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Tell Them Will. Uh, my husband years ago sent me an article that Dr. Jarrett wrote um, about how we can change our narrative and the, the way that this impacts our identity. And he quoted Dr. Kate McLean out of, at Eastern Washington University. And I got to interview her a couple of years ago. And she definitely had some influence on the book that I published last year. But Dr. Christian Jarrett had even more influence on my book because he's the one that wrote the article and started driving me toward that area of storytelling and the actual research that supports all of the work that I've been doing for the last five years. So I'm thrilled. Christian, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, hi, Sarah, and thank you very much for having me on your show. Absolutely. So um, the question I always ask my guests when we first start is I, I always ask them to share something about themselves that most people probably don't know about them, maybe something from their childhood. or um, and, the, and the reason that I ask this question is that I, I really like our our listeners to have some context for who you are before we dive into your your stories of why. <laughs> um, I was having to think about this, and um, I mean, one thing I thought of that, that sort of links up with my book a little bit because it's to do with personality is when I was in my late teens, I tried and failed uh, three times to get a job as a um, shelf stacker at one, at one of our biggest. <laughs> one of our biggest uh, supermarket chains here in the UK, uh, Tesco. So I think it's a bit like Walmart in America or, or something like that. Um, and you, I had a friend who was working there already, and he said, "There's a, you know, there's an opening. They're looking for someone else. Um, all, all you have to do is send in uh, a letter, and you have to fill out this little personality test. And it was about, I don't know, like twelve items or something, and." It was asking you questions about how much you like to work as a team, like how uh, how collaborative you are, and also, but also how um, whether you can work independently, how much initiative you have. Anyway, it was uh, three times I filled out this uh, this test, and every time I f I couldn't get the job. I was told I was failing on the personality test. <laughs> oh, ouch! How old were you? <laughs> Um, I must have been about 16, something like that. Oh my gosh, that doesn't cause any damage, does it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, it wasn't a big deal in a way, but it, I, I was, I think my interest in psychology was already growing at the time. And it, it was quite funny because I, that, you know, the first time I was told I hadn't answered it correctly, I tried to be much more strategic the next time. I think I tried to paint myself as a team player. That didn't work. So then I tried to paint myself as a, you know, sort of a, uh, more of a lone wolf solo worker that didn't work either so I don't know what they were looking for but um yeah I failed on personality tests early in my life and um th there's one other later much later on when I around the time I was doing my PhD uh, in cognitive neuroscience and I'd I'd realized that I wanted to leave academia 
I wasn't in, enjoying my PhD a huge amount. So I was looking for other, you know, where am I going to go with my career? And I actually, I saw an advert to apply for um, MI5, you know, our, our domestic oh, yeah. security agency. <laughs> It's like the it's like the FBI or the CIA here in the US. Uh, yeah, CIA maybe. CIA. Uh-huh. Yeah. And um again I fell foul of a this time much more in-depth kind of psychometric test. I think <laughs> this this one was um I got past the first hurdle and then I got taken to this testing center where you had to do this really long-winded test, which was all about your problem solving kind of mentality, I think. But I again I fell foul of psychological testing (laughs) and I didn't get to the next stage so (laughs) well that explains so much about your book (laughs) love that oh my gosh so you failed three times to be a a stalker or stack a a stack or whatever in in a grocery store did you ever end up working there no I didn't no I I did work on it at a little corner shop grocers Mm -hmm. uh, at home but no not I never got a job at the big at the big corporate um, supermarket, no. <laughs> so not that I'm going to try to psychoanalyze you or anything, <laughs> <laughs> but I am. I I have to say that um, I find it really interesting, this juxtaposition that you applied for a giant grocery store job and you applied for a giant um, government, you know, public sector agency and failed out their personality test but you ended up getting a job at a corner store and, <laughs> yeah. and now you're working with a small team. And I have to say, I, I think that that actually explains a lot about your personality and they weren't wrong that you didn't need a large place to, to really shine. And that wasn't going to be your best place to do work in a, in a large agency because it, you don't have to be a lone wolf or super gregarious person to know that a smaller agency where you can really shine and do all kinds of different jobs is going to be a far better fit for you. Does, is that kind of what you found later on? Oh, uh, well, funnily enough. Yeah. I was not going to mention that, but yeah, actually at the, at the little corner shop, um, I mean, this is what I should say. This is just a, you know, a small holiday job to get me over the summer. Um, but yeah, I did well at that little corner shop. I think they made me team leader. You know, you, uh, you get to lock up at the end of the day and that kind of thing. <laughs> so. Right. Well, that's a big responsibility for a 16, 17 year old, right? Yeah. 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 So you, yeah, maybe um, I, I like your positive spin. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people have said that before. I like your positive spin, but I, I don't consider it spin. I consider it observation. Yeah. Yeah. No, oh, that's it, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So it's, uh, I wonder sometimes if I would be able to play the test, the like the you know the personality test a bit better now that I know more about them. But um, who knows? Yeah, it kind of defeats the purpose, though, doesn't it? Sure. <laughs> I I say that because um, I am a Strengths Finder coach with the Gallup tool, Strengths Finder, yeah. and um, there are people who try to play it, and and the truth usually comes out because they ask questions in a variety of ways, uh, but. I have heard of a, a coach who didn't like her top strengths. And so she manipulated herself. I'm actually reading your book in very great interest because of this, this thing that I heard a story about is all hearsay, but I'm sure it's true. Um, but she managed over time to retake the, the assessment enough times to lower her significance, which is one of the top strengths it was originally. And a lot of people don't like that one in their top strengths because it feels um, egocentric. It's not when it's used right. That's why it's a strength. Uh, yeah. But a lot of people are, are they don't like that one because it makes them feel like they are egocentric in some way and they don't want to be perceived that way. So she managed to drop that down lower into her list and raise up some of the other ones and I, I am so curious now, I kind of want to meet this person. And I think I could get an introduction from her friend that told me the story to find out if she used some of these strategies that you talk about in your book and if she actually has changed or if she just manipulated the assessment. Yeah, that'd be, 
that those are two very different ways to go, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, they are. They're yeah. completely different. Yeah, oh, I mean, interesting. I'd like, yeah, I'd like to think it is possible to genuinely change your personality trait scores, um, f- especially if it's for the right reasons. Um, but um, yeah, faking is a whole other. <laughs> no, manipulation yeah that's yeah, like uh, and as you say um you know what would be the point in a way because you, you know who who are you kidding and, and if and, it, and if you're just um falsifying your performance on a test that's going to affect i don't know where you get allocated in a job or something and you've you faked it then it's probably going to backfire isn't it absolutely think. yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think people can see right through that fake, even if they don't consciously see through it, Mm -hmm. because there are all those signs, you know, about this, obviously, you know, about this, the micro expressions that you pick up that you don't necessarily know you're picking up all those subconscious um, expressions on the person's face, and the body language, and even their pheromones, you pick up that fakeness, even if you don't know you're picking it up. Mm -hmm. It changes yeah. the relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I think the motives behind that kind of thing are key. You know, mm-hmm. if it's cheating, you know, if it, 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 especially if someone's just looking for a quick fix, um, yeah. just cheating the system, um, I would think they would come unstuck. So I wouldn't endorse that at all. But I think if they, if, if people want to change themselves for genuine reasons, and and if they want to do it in the service of their um, deeply held values and goals then that that's that's what I, I'm in favor of in, in my book that you, you know we can it is within our powers to change our traits um, in the service of those more meaningful goals that that's what I would argue yes well that's what I was just reading the the section on prisoners and um, it once they've spent time in prison how that changes their brain and the, their personality it really changes even for a short time is what I just read is even if yeah. they're only in prison for a short time it can significantly change the way their brain works yeah well prison is a very good example of I, I think what personality psychologists would call a strong situation so in terms of explaining why we behave the way we do it's always a mixture of our personality traits uh, and the situational influences and obviously some of those situational influences are stronger than others right yeah trauma yeah and prison you know you could not get a much more stronger uh, situational influence because um, obviously the restrictions the the culture uh, and so on and in a, in a way the the example of how prison changes um Prisoners' personalities is a real life kind of experiment that shows how we are shaped by the environment to a degree. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of the, uh, much of the nature of prison seems to be for many prisoners counterproductive. Oh, Uh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's um, uh, too harsh. Um, It's too punishing and, and harsh and leads them to come out um you know with more stressed and and having less trust of other people and uh, and and so on which is you know not uh, conducive to rehabilitation at all right of course of course and it's it's gotten worse in the US than than anywhere else in terms of incarceration rates so when you think about your book um i you knew you were going to write this book it's been in you for a long time um Was there a turning point in the book where something happened and it surprised you, the research you were doing for it, or um, took you in a slightly different direction than you had anticipated? Was there a moment where you were like, oh my gosh, this is, this is so right. Or, oh my gosh, I need to switch direction a little here. Um, I'm not sure if there was ever a kind of turning point. I think I was always all the way through writing it. and, And even now, you know, sort of, um, following 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 me around is this question of have people ever truly changed <laughs> like or will they you know will they revert or do we revert back um 
And, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time while I was writing the book. My, I, I suppose my forte is looking at the psychological findings in research papers mm-hmm. and that kind of thing. And the challenge for me was finding real life stories to, to support the kind of the theory and, and the experimental findings that I was uncovering. And mm-hmm. so that, that was, that was the biggest challenge, I suppose. And and of course, I, in, in looking for stories, I, I read quite a few memoirs by different characters. And of course, I found tales of people changing for the worse as well as ch- ch- changing for the better. And it's I, it, real life is obviously, you know, so messy and complicated. And so, yeah, a big challenge is trying to trying to see how the the controlled laboratory studies and, and all these experiments with psychology students, as so many of them are, how how do they apply it in the messiness of real life? And and is it possible to pull out real tangible lessons for for us in our in our lives? And and there are, you know, it's a leap. It's a leap from the experimental evidence. It's a bit of a leap to give people kind of life lessons. It's also a bit of a leap to take lessons from people's life stories as well, the more anecdotal evidence. Um, mm-hmm. Of course, you can pick and choose and how can you ever capture the whole complexity? Uh, but th- anyway, that's what I've tried to do in the book anyway, is try and I've sort of tried to use the, I did find some stories and I and I, and I draw, drew on my, some of my own experiences and people I've known and um, anyway, mixed it all together to try and mm-hmm. hopefully make a convincing case that that we, people can truly change uh, if if they want to enough. They have to. I think they have to want to. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think they're more likely to succeed if, if, as I mentioned, if it's for a genuinely held goal, you know, mm-hmm. or value or values, you know, rather than for its own sake, you know, rather than just thinking. Oh, I want to be more extroverted just for its own sake, you know, I think is less likely to be successful. Right. Um, I'd like to drill down just a little in terms of change, what we're talking about in terms of can people change? Because um, I just had this great conversation with uh, a woman, uh, Swati Singh, who just published a, a fictional novel called Her Brave Journey. And we were talking about her youth. She actually worked for her local police department for a little while when she was in high school and she was very much an introvert and the fact that she even applied for this job when she looks back now she's surprised by her younger self applying for this job and I said well you know that's it doesn't surprise me she said well I think I've changed I'm a very different person now than I was then and I'm looking back at her stories thinking no you aren't it was all there in your young adulthood you just didn't know it yet because you hadn't explored it yet. And if you talk to the police officer that you were traveling with in that car, he would probably say, oh yeah, you were always like that. And, and so I, I think about that in the context of change. I also think about people um, like my friend, John, who was very much a loner, had not been in touch with his family for many years then he had a major health issue, like big time health issue, almost died. And his brother showed up for him. And having his brother and his wife show up for him, become his advocates, take him back to their home with them to rehabilitate so that he wouldn't be on his own. He changed. I saw him change. Um, but I think it was always in him to be a kind and, and nurturing person because I know him and I've known him before and after, but he changed the way that he demonstrates that because he cares now about what his brother thinks of him. Like it it changed because he saw something in that generosity that made him realize that he needed to acknowledge that generosity and become the kind of person that cares about other people. Does that make sense? So what are we talking about in, in terms of change? Can you give me an example from your book, maybe one of the stories that you read or heard from somebody? Yeah, well, what I suppose um, first off, something you made me think of is this idea of really our personality is you, you can you can see it as a distribution profile of like. So in other words, 
um, an introvert, strong introvert, doesn't uh, act introverted all the time in every situation. There will be moments when they act more extroverted. So we're not, you know, we've got a bit like you're talking about potential. It's like we have all these different sides to us within us and cha changing your personality it sounds radical and dramatic, but it, it, it can be a case of shifting those distribution profiles. So just acting extroverted a little bit more often, you know, rather than, rather than thinking I'm changing my type. Right. You know, um, and I think to make meaning, to, to achieve meaningful change, you don't have, it doesn't have to be a radical transformation. It could just be increasing the frequency with which you act more extroverted. And then related to that is when you look at those kind of, if you, if you imagine it as a distribution over time of how often you act, uh, well, let's get away from introverted, extroverted, take something like how often uh, you act uh, kind of more conscientious versus uh, disorganized. Oblivious. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, there might there might be factors or certain people who bring out you know with, with who in whose company you more often act that way so by changing who you spend your time with or the roles that you play all these kind of things shape shape the manifestation and expression of our personality traits so you you know your listeners might be able to think of certain people who they feel a certain way around or you know they 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 feel differently with uh, one friend than they do another you know and they they like there's one friend who makes them feel more outgoing or makes them feel more um confident confident and ambitious and so on and obviously if you were to be more intentional about uh your life and your personality you might choose to spend more time with the people who bring out that side of your character uh, so I think that's one way of looking at it. And in, and in terms of what you said about, um, you know, responding to kindness, um, that does remind me a little bit of straight away of one story of my book, which is about Majid Nawaz, who um, I, I don't know if you've heard of him. He, he He's a British um, political campaigner now. Well, he's actually like a peace campaigner now. But earlier in his life, he was a, a fundamentalist Islamist. And he, as a teenager, he went around with a knife strapped to his back. Um, he ended up in prison in Egypt for fomenting terrorism and, and so on. And one of the, I think, the kind of turning points for him was when uh, Amnesty International stood up for him and began campaigning for his release because on the basis that he was being held in prison purely for his beliefs at that, at that time. That was the only evidence against him. And he, he writes in his memoir about how it, how transformative it was for him, the kindness shown to him by those strangers. And that was one, it, it wasn't the whole story, but that was one of the, you know, defining moments on his path to rehabilitation and turning his life around and his personality around. And maybe that chimes a little bit with what you're saying about that story you told. It absolutely does. And it doesn't have to be somebody who has the potential to become an extremist and, and violent. I, I think in general, the more kindness we experience, the more we understand how valuable it is. And we start to recognize our own value on the planet. And that's been my experience with, especially with youth, when one person starts to believe in them and says, you, you have this in you. And then they start to see this in other people toward them because they're, they're starting to experience it. Um, it, it seems, it seems to me that that can often be a trigger for a change. I don't, I, I'm still not convinced they're not, that they're changing their personality. And so I love that you put it in the, this visual for me of it being on a spectrum that your personality isn't going to, it doesn't have to be extreme. You don't have to go from being um, a shy wallflower to being a totally outgoing extrovert, or even somebody who cowers to being somebody who stands up to bullies. Um, I, I think some people get stuck in this whole idea that they have to have a transformation. And I love that you put that in a different language, a different perspective, taking those small steps. And I did get to that part in your book where you actually have um, 
specific steps in an outline form for how to start to make those shifts. And you can do it gradually. You can choose to do a meetup, as you said, and and find a group of like-minded people or people that don't think like you and you would like to, to steer yourself in that direction. That's really cool. Yeah, I, well, I love the idea that just small, you know, subtle tweaks can, can snowball potentially. If um, I know we're talking quite a lot about kind of confidence and being outgoing, but sometimes I think that's because it's the most vivid, it's the most tangible in a way. I mean, if you do boost your, if you can boost your confidence and your willingness to take risks as well, which that, that's part of what being more extroverted is about. It's not just about being chatty and, and what have you. It's, it's partly your willingness to, you know, put yourself out there and take risks. Um, I Sometimes I think, you know, well, what if, even if it's just the difference one day between whether you ha- had the, you know, the, the audacity to go up and speak to a stranger at a, a, a networking event or um, or speak to a stranger on a train or whatever, I just think, you know, can you can imagine how these things could snowball potentially, and it it, it, mm-hmm. it could lead lead your life down a different path that it might not have done otherwise. Mm-hmm. And that, that's how I've tried to see it, it in myself because I I would say I'm I've de- definitely got strong introverted tendencies, and I I'm not aiming like you say for this like radical transformation. I don't think I'm ever going to be the kind of person who bounces around on stage, you know, giving a flamboyant um, presentation. Uh, but I, I like the idea of making, trying to change myself to be a little bit more inclined to say yes to opportunities and maybe just pre- be prepared to take risks and, you know, things might go wrong, um, but you might, le- you know, I might learn from it. And just, you know, I, I think that can be broadening, a broadening expert, you know, life expanding if you can just... Um, come out of your shell a little bit and be more willing to, you know, to take those gambles. Well, I'm, I'm thinking about another example so that if any of our listeners are struggling or haven't seen themselves yet in, in the discussion, I was thinking about people who have a tendency to not be friendly or kind and, um, and they want to be more friendly and kind. They like spending time with people who are friendly and kind, but a lot of friendly and kind people don't want to spend time with people who aren't that way. Right. So um, I love this idea of a gradual thing of um, maybe running into somebody that, you know, trying to ask them a question, being curious about them just just one time rather than launching into a complaint about your life or about somebody else, because that has a tendency to, to come across as not friendly and kind, you know, showing up at a coffee shop, running into somebody, you know, and saying, hey, um, yeah, how's how's work going? Or I I noticed a picture of you and your dog on Mount Helena. Do you do that a lot? Yeah, or you know, walking in the streets, do you do that a lot? Asking them just a very basic question where you're generating a conversation and just doing that once a week so that you can start getting comfortable with it. And what I see is that as soon as you do that and you get a positive response, it makes you want to do it more, right? So tell us about the brain science behind that, because that is also a big part of your book is the the neuroscience behind these strategies. Well, so, some of the personality traits more, more than others are, I would say that they are they are very much kind of habit based. You know, it's it, and so part of the way to changing yourself it is to change your habits, and it, it it's going at first it will feel effortful and it might feel an ordeal, but it it means. You, you can start gradually, like just as you described. And a good way to do it is, yeah, to set these very specific, modest goals, uh, you know, uh, behavioral changes. <laughs> and the more specific you are and the more that you commit to them, the more likely you are to, su- to succeed in changing over time. There's actually research suggests if you just have vague goals to change without specific plans for how to do it actually it's likely to backfire Hmm. so So you start um, to resent it (laughs) yeah and maybe because of the lack of progress you end up maybe feeling like you've almost regressed further from what you were aspiring to so it all it just spirals yeah backwards um so yes specific for some traits more than others um 
the extroversion again is definitely a very sort of habit based trait i would say and and part of what you can do by changing your behavior and those kind of baby steps at first and then build, building up um with more ambition is uh, so you 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 you're partly recalibrating um your brain as you say i mean one of the key differences between introverts and extroverts is seems to be in um like sensitivity to arousal and stimulation obviously if you if you're um you're shy and introverted and you spend a lot of time alone it's not really a surprise it's going to be overwhelming the first time like if you if you go from that to a part you know a noisy party or what have you it's going to be a, even at a neural level quite overwhelming so partly through these little behavioral habits where you you know you just get used to, get yourself used to more social contact and what have you I think we we know that our, our brains are incredibly, you know, malleable. We're ch- they're changing all the time, depending on what we do with ourselves, with our days. So the the more you ease yourself into um, more stimulating situations, there's going to be a kind of recalibration that that occurs. And yeah, exactly. And, and as you said, if it, if it's rewarding as well. Um, that's going to help you change as well, obviously, if, if, if you find it rewarding. And there are some neat studies that, as, along the lines you're describing that show, for example, um, people tend to uh, enjoy talking to strangers much more than they think they're going to. And, and they tend to be much more positively perceived than they think they're, they're going to. That There was one study where the researchers went out on, I think, trains, comm- commuter trains and started up conversations with strangers <laughs> to see how it would go and, and how they were perceived, you know, and it, and it, it all bit, you know, the, the, the kind of main takeaway was it was much more fun than they thought it was going to be. And they were seen um, by the other commuters in a much more positive way than they thought. And um, so, yeah, I mean, it's worth a try, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> well, it definitely is. If it's, um, if whatever characteristic you're frustrated with, is really causing problems in terms of your relationships with other people, your career, um, your your ultimate goals. I have a friend who um, recently realized after working with this company for about eight months that the people she's working with will never see her as their equal. They'll never see her as somebody who can contribute in this organization. And so she is realizing that she has to make a change. So there are aspects of her personality, the, these tendencies to be happy and smiley, even when she's not, ha- that she can make these gradual changes of standing up for herself and, and make it feel like it's okay. And so it, it is wreaking havoc on her career if, if she's never going to grow with this company. So being able to identify the characteristic and say, okay, what is it that's keeping me here? What is it in my personality that's um, keeping me here? Is it fear? Am I, am I making decisions that are fear-based? Um, am I making decisions because I don't want to deal with conflict? Um, and all of those things and taking those baby steps of calling out some bad behavior, like, hey, I just saw you roll your eyes when I asked that question. And that's kind of hurtful. I, I'm new to this. I'm just learning this. And just calling them out on that behavior, suddenly you develop this confidence. Oh, I just did that. Wow. Yeah. I just I just did that. <laughs> yeah, I think there's this term some psychologists use called self-signaling. Yeah. So mm-hmm. in you that that's where the, you know, there is a, a grain of truth to the fake it till you make it uh, approach. Because, yeah, but, you know, um, by behaving in a certain way, you're signaling to yourself that you're capable of behaving that way. And if you start to shift your own identity sort of at a a higher ordinate level, like what kind of how you see yourself, that's all going to contribute to the momentum in terms of positive change. So, yeah, if you if you can demonstrate to yourself, I mean, because we're and I suppose in a way this comes back to the, you know, telling the stories that we tell aspect. Yeah, if you. Because of course we all reflect back on our own behaviour, you know, and so if you, by being willing to act, sometimes it may be out of character. If it feels, it might feel awkward and daunting at first, and inauthentic. 
which is a scary word these days. Yeah. (laughs) And of course, you are signaling to yourself that you can do that. And then the more and the more time you do it, you start to change your own sense of who you are. You know, I am the kind of person who stands up for myself. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Because then you have evidence, you have stories that yeah. that give you the evidence to say, oh, well, I did it this one time and I nailed it. So I've been telling myself this, um, you know, the story of when I was 15 and didn't stand up to these girls that were mean to me and I stayed hanging out with them and I still tried really hard to be their friend. So you, you're telling this story. Um, and, and so that paints this picture in your own mind that that's who you are still. And here you are 30 years later and you're still telling that story from that perspective instead of telling the story of maybe three years later when you're in college, you stood up to a bully. And and instead of telling that story, you're telling the other story because that's what you still believe about yourself. Yeah, and you could create your own kind of turning points Mm -hmm. by... This that was, you know, this is going to be the first day that I broke that pattern. And then that's the first time. And then if you can try and build make a habit of it and build a pattern, then eventually with the passage of time, you'll look back on that day that it it was a turning point where you you left your past self behind. Exactly. This different version of you emerged. That's uh, so cool. (laughs) Yeah. I mean. Some of the advice I've read, and uh, it, it's more tangible in a way for things like um, habit change to do with when people want to, um, I don't know, be more physically active or something, like they want to be a runner or they want to be more open-minded and they, and they wish they read more books. Identity comes into it then as well, you see, because, again, you do if you can build up the habit so you go running once a week or you you um, read one page of a book per day or something. It doesn't have to be huge. But if you can start to change your sense of self, well, I'm the kind of person who goes for a run once a week or I'm the kind of person who dips into a book. You can you um, that's obviously, you know, maybe less profound than uh, issues of, you know, um, being confident and standing up to bullies or what have you. But it's the same principle that if you can change through that self-signaling behavior, how you perceive yourself, it's going to really help your motivation and momentum um, in the future. Right. And I think it's interesting that sometimes we still get stuck, even if we have all this evidence. I've been running once a week for two years, and I'm still telling the story about how I'm not a runner and I'm not athletic. (laughs) <laughs> right. Like we hold on to those for so long, even though we have all this evidence that we are a runner. And as an example, um, I have been a ceramic artist for years and I started at this co-op um, clay studio here in Montana. And for five years, I had been well, I actually had studio space for 13 years. So I was using the wheel, throwing pots, selling some of my work, giving it away as gifts for for 13 years. But five years into this, I had been doing this for five years. And somebody said, so uh, what kind of artist are you? There was something about me. This woman decided that I was an artist. I still don't know how she knew. But I said, oh, I'm not an artist. And she said, wait, what? And I said, I'm not an artist. Well, what do you do in your free time? I said, well, sometimes I go and I... I throw pots at the clay arts guild and then I decorate them and I put a handle on them and I glaze them. And, and she's like, well, that sounds like an artist to me. And I was still holding on to this idea that since I couldn't draw when I was a little girl, I could not draw to save my life. You you wouldn't even believe the stick figures that came out of my brain and onto paper, but that's why I wasn't an artist. And that's why I told myself I wasn't an artist. So I I hear what you're saying that you can change these. I think in addition, if you want to strengthen that change, you have to understand why your story is still telling you that you're not an athlete. Yeah. Do do you know why you didn't see yourself as an artist? Do you think because of the draw, just because you saw being an artist as being able to draw? Yes. Being someone who can draw. And um, I have a lot of friends that are professional artists professional ceramic artists, professional illustrators. 
And so because I didn't see myself as a professional artist, I had a hard time describing myself as an artist. What is that label anyway? And um, when I was a little girl, I was in like fourth or fifth grade, decided I was going to make sculptures of dinosaurs for the science fair because I love dinosaurs. And it was going to be one of those demonstrations where you have the the images of the dinosaur and all the data about them, you know, when they, what era they lived and what they ate, all that stuff. And then I was going to have this sculpture that I had done out of clay. And my mom was trying hard to dissuade me because I couldn't draw. And so she was afraid I was going to fail trying to sculpt. And um, I remember I finally convinced her to give me clay, to buy me clay for this project. And I made a Triceratops because Triceratops is my Uh, favorite because it has the name Sarah in the middle. Names are really important. And I made this Triceratops and my mom came by the kitchen table where she saw me working. And I knew immediately the shock on her face and how good it was. And it really looks like a Triceratops. And I will never forget her shock. Like, oh my gosh, that looks really good. And part of me was thinking, don't be so surprised. <laughs> but that's a story. And, and that story was how I defined not being an artist. You know, because I couldn't draw. And so clearly I wasn't an artist. And yeah. my poor mom, it's not her fault. You know, she'd hear this story and she'd be mortified, (laughs) but that's, those are the stories that shape who we think we are at such young ages. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. And we, there are probably lots of these that we're not necessarily conscious of, don't you think that? Oh yeah. Yeah. That have an influence on how we feel and how we live and even the the decisions we make. So can you think of one of those stories in your life that you're doing, that you continue to kind of fight with? Well, I think it's probably, yeah, to do with the, the sort of the the introversion thing for me personally, I, I can think of lots of occasions and I, and I've always hated this where people make assumptions about the kind of thing that, that you will or won't enjoy or be willing to do or try. So I think I've, especially maybe when I was younger, I would have um, family, maybe, you know, well-meaning family um, and later uh, uh, managers or what have you, you know, would say, I remember being told, for example, well, you're you're very good at writing, but I definitely don't think uh, being a podcast presenter is something you can do. And that just made me all the more determined to, for for a short time, I presented a podcast. for the British Psychological Society, it just made me want to do that even more. I didn't like Spite. being told. Yeah, I didn't <laughs> like being told that's not what you, you know, the kind of thing that you won't want to do or you won't be good at. Um, I think even actually going all the way back to uh, when I was age 10, um, I was trying out for a number of different schools and one of them was uh, a boarding school and I went to visit with my mum and it's, a, you know, this huge, almost like a university campus. You know, they had these incredible grounds, huge buildings. The kids there seemed incredibly confident and outgoing. And, uh, and I remember my mom saying to me as we got back into the car, well, you're, I, you're not going to want to go here, are you? <laughs> like, and I think it was almost her saying that. I, you know, I was like, why not? Why wouldn't I want to? Why wouldn't I want to go here? And I, and then from that point, I was determined to go to that school. <laughs> <laughs> well, that says a lot more about you than it does about your mother. <laughs> well, and the fact that, so now I'm piecing together all these aspects of your personality, Christian, and I'm just <laughs> loving, loving where this is going because um, you tried three times to get that job as a shelver, three <laughs> times. Like, and every time you're like, I'm going to get this job mostly out of spite for people telling me I can't. (laughs) (laughs) I think so. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know how people can box you into a, like they've got you pigeonholed Mm -hmm. and, and, and from that flows the kind of things that you either can do or you'll want to do. And I, I, I guess I've never liked that idea that of being, sort of pigeonholed and like people have got you worked out. Um. (laughs) That explains so much of your inspiration in your work. It really does. And I love that. 
I feel the same way. And it, it drives me crazy. And we do it to others. Like I'm sure you have experiences where you kind of didn't invite somebody somewhere because you thought they wouldn't like it. Oh, definitely. I'm definitely guilty of doing it to other people. I, I think we all do it because it's how we navigate partly our social relationships, obviously, isn't it? It's how we make sense mm-hmm. of each other. And so, um, yeah, it's totally understandable. But at the same time, we maybe over, we overdo it, even if we're well-meaning. We maybe... Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As a parent. As, <laughs> yeah, we maybe see each other as more fixed and le- uh, less flexible than we are, I would say. So, that yeah, that's partly the motive behind the book, I suppose, is testing the limits of this kind of thing. But, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's not just um, that I want to test my own limits. It's also what I got out of the book is we need to be really careful about how we're setting limits for others by saying that's a bad person or um, this is a a cheap person. This person is too frugal or this person is that or whatever Um, as, as a community if we want to get past the polarization that we're experiencing globally, we have to stop seeing people in these black and white labels. Yeah, and we we can help bring out the best in each other, can't we, I think? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, I mean, that is something that comes out of the book is because I, I tell a few stories of people uh, you know, with trouble in their past who managed to turn their lives around. And it does make you think, you know, uh, of the dangers of writing people off prematurely and also how important um, relationships are in helping people turn their lives around. So so maybe we each could be one of those people who helps someone else make positive changes. Yeah, absolutely. It's not Mm -hmm. just about, I think some of the important messages are not just about how can we change ourselves for the better, but how can we support others, other people in making positive changes. Hmm. That's a perfect place to wrap up. I I love that. And of course, it's something that's really meaningful to me because that's that's the whole purpose of my book, of, of your book, of so much of the work you and I do around stories and people, understanding humanity without trying to set boundaries around them, around us as humans. Ah, I love that. So Christian, when our listeners get a hold of this podcast they're going to want to hear more about your book so um why don't you tell me where people can reach you where people can get the book um what your other work is that people might be interested in following well um my my day job these days is i'm a deputy editor of psyche magazine which launched last year is from the is from the founders of Eon Magazine or Aon Magazine, uh, as it's called in America. Um, <laughs> and yeah, we launched last year. It's it, it's a it's a mixture of psychology and philosophy, and it's it's all delving into the human condition and helping readers uh, to live how to live well. Like, you know, we we explore all those sort of questions. Um, so that's. That's my day job, and I, I commission psychologists and philosophers and clinicians to write. So we 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 publish experts, academic experts, and and practitioners, and we help them write in a way uh, that will be accessible for general public. Um, so that's Psyche Magazine, and um, I'm on Twitter. I'm a Psych Writer. On Twitter, there's an underscore between psych and writer. So I'm like a writer on Twitter. Okay. Well, I will make sure that these links are on the blog post associated with the podcast, as well as a link to that original article that put me in touch with you in the first place. And I'll also have a link to the to purchase your book, which is going to be released when? In the US and Canada, I think it's 18th of May. Awesome. 18th of May. I'm so excited for that. And I will definitely be be sharing that as soon as it's available here in the US. Christian, thank you so much for joining me today. It was an absolute pleasure to get to know you. Oh, thanks to you, Sarah. I I really appreciate being invited on your show and thank you for the opportunity. Are you ready to start your story portfolio so you have the right story ready to share when the opportunity presents itself? 
When you're ready to get started, my book, Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Tell Them Will, is available in all the regular places. And the audiobook version is available on Google Play and on my website, elkinsconsulting.com. As a special bonus for listeners, the audiobook includes two songs recorded by my band, Spare Change, in my living room in Montana. Also on my website is a free podcast interview checklist. It's available to download to make sure you make the most out of your next podcast interview. If you enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to rate the podcast and leave a review and let me know that you've done it so I can thank you properly. Thank you.